Hi, on MPI, brought to you by DigiKey and Adafruit this week is Arduino Q, my product pick of the week. It's also Lamore's. What is the Arduino Q? Yeah, this is actually on yeah, the sure. front page of digikey.com, yeah. which is, you know, really big deal. Yeah, it makes you think it was every deal. manufacturer, supplier, and everything. They're like, okay, Qualcomm, you bought Arduino. Let's go. And they have it in stock. And Lady Ada did a deep dive. I have one on order. We do. So you're going to learn about it from the Lady Ada point of view. Whether you like it or not. Whether you like it or not. Not the press release and not the uh, ChatGPT press release that was generated, Qualcomm, shame on you. Uh, anyways, this is a real deal. Yeah. Um, so this is the new board from Arduino, and this is part of their collaboration slash release from uh, the Qualcomm acquisition that occurred about a week ago. So this is an Arduino Uno shaped board, but it's like jam packed with tons of processing power, wireless, a uh, little LED matrix, um, the standard headers that you know and love, uh, STEMIQT slash quick connector, SPI, et cetera. On the bottom, you've got these dual 60 pin contacts. We'll talk about those. Hey, a ton gonna, of I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop you right there. I'm gonna stop you right there. Yeah. This is so cool that there's a quick connector on this. This is yeah. something that the community asked for a really long time. And um, way to go, SparkFun. We said, we're going to do this connector. It turned they into did. a standard. And so did, yeah. we they have did. Stemma. Stemma is the, the more compatible one. Quick gets you just as far on this board. It's awesome. And then they've, Arduino has the modulinos, which we've covered. That's and right. there's other companies, too. There's right. dozens of and, companies making and, stuff. In them. And, you know, it's these things come along because the entire community was doing it. And although Arduino started off with different connectors, they came around and now it's there. Yes. Anyways, it's, very it's good. worth shouting out. Good work. I'm going to shout out to Nate at SparkFun because he's the one who came up with it. That's right. That's right. Um, it's a, it takes a village. Okay. Uh, on the bottom, um, they got these uh, contacts, these two 60-pin uh, contacts. So, you know, these are uh, evocative of like the compute module on the Raspberry Pi. You can plug it in uh, for high-speed connectivity. Uh, and we'll talk about what's available on, on both sets of contacts, uh, plus all the memory and um, peripherals, which we'll talk over. And then you see it says Arduino Uno Q, and then powered by the Qualcomm Dragonwing. That's the processor that's on the board. There's also an STM32, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but this is a beefy Arduino Uno shaped yeah. board. It's kind of the latest in the family. Um, it's got a, a QRB2210 microprocessor unit. That's what's going to be running um linux it's an a53 and then it also has some like i think it also has some uh microcontrollers inside some questions yeah sure so this has the dragon wing yeah the other so the the there is another board out there that we like that has dragon wing as well and i should say it's the tachyon from yeah. particle but there's a modem on it so that, that is one it. is it's more cellular based yeah. and it's not it's for that one you really do like you log into it i'll talk about yeah, this yeah. it doesn't have the user experience yeah, yeah. that's simplified. It's, it's like, you're just in Linux. Yeah, so that's the thing. It's like, it's interesting. So Dragon Wing has, a, it's, it could be like that, or it could be like this. Yeah. This is their, I guess, probably their second entry into this world of like the maker world, I guess. Because I think Tachyon- You know what's funny? Would, Actually, the TN, which I didn't I didn't put the link in, was also a Qualcomm, it was an Atheros. There was uh, also a Qualcomm board. I, I didn't realize this was not the first uh, Qualcomm. And of course, Qualcomm's done other single board Linux computers. This yeah. is the first time they're, I think, I think what's interesting about this is that they're actually trying to make it easy for people to use because I think the challenge is that, you know, you um, Linux is something, you know, like I grew up with Linux and you grew up with Linux, but for a lot of people, um, it's advanced, complicated. You have to do like BusyBox, you have to do distribution, you have to, do, you know, compile kernels. So the idea about- Well, it didn't work out. I mean, like for the desktop and for learning, like we have a lot of work to do. For everything else it did. Now, now yeah. let's work on the next part, which is yeah. getting everyone up to it. And I think this is, this will be one of the ways Mm. Um, or something like it. Mm. Um, yeah. So what what they did is they combined what you know, unlike most single board lens computers, this one is combined. It has that Cortex A fifty three and it has an STM thirty two microcontroller unit that's connected, and I believe it's connected over um, UART slash SPI. It's like the you look at the block diagram, and um, messages are passed back and forth. And so one of the issues with Dragon Wing processors, it's it's can be challenging with people is oftentimes they're 1.8 volt logic 
And you, know, you can use logic level shifters, but those can get oscillate and flaky and they're difficult to use. And of course, it doesn't have analog digital input. It doesn't have a DAC output and you're expecting, it's basically meant to be a Linux computer. It's not meant, and then, you know, it would connect over uh, low voltage, low power um, peripherals like a camera or a display. It's not like, not to bet for bit banging. So the STM32 is the chip on here that does the, you know, analog reads and, and PWM outputs and has timers and you, you can connect it to a relay or a step motor. Um, whereas the computing is done by the um, Dragonwing QRB2210. Uh, um, they come with two options, either 16 or 32 gig eMMC, so you don't need an SD card. You flash the image on there. It's got two or four gigabytes of SD RAM as well. So it's like, you, know, you can actually run like, you know, pretty serious Linux. Um, it has uh, onboard Wi-Fi or Bluetooth um, wireless that has a kernel driver, so you don't have to like, link your own, you know, SSL certificate chain into like, you know, like you would with an espresso chip, it's ready to go. It's always up to date. Um, and it can do, you know, uh, five, uh, Wi-Fi five or uh, 2.4 gigahertz. Um, there's USB-C and you can do, um, video output, which is really cool. And, but it has also like all the headers that you expect, um, to be able to connect existing when shields. You say video output, what do you mean? So the USB-C can actually act like you, know, you can plug it into a, um, the DisplayPort monitor. Oh. Yeah, if you wanted to. So I think that would be for desktop mode, I imagine. Or if you mm. wanted to have it, um, there's like a web API. I saw like some examples of like it has a web dashboard and it would display it on the monitor. So that's how you do. Yeah, because it, it has MIPI display, but that's that's like HDMI yeah. output. Yeah, it's neat that, I mean, could you run an, a Linux or Arduino ID on one chip and program the Arduino chip with the other? I think, I mean, I think it does underneath. <laughs> I, right? I, don't, I don't like that. <laughs> no, I mean, like you personally, could you like- could you, you like, can do whatever you want. I wow. mean, it's Linux, you can log in and then you can, you know, you don't need- I'd be like operating on myself. I like this integrated package idea. First. Right, I mean, if you want to, you, you like, there's always stories about the doctor that does like a spleen like removal on their own. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah, like you, but it's better to just use the app lab. Yeah. Um, so last time we talked, we talked to them is they were doing, you know, the Nano R4 and, and we also had the R4 Uno yeah. um, as part of their series. And what's interesting about those is those are still like microcontrollers that you program. And like, you know, the Uno, which almost everyone like grew up with is a microcontroller. And you would you do is you connect with the Arduino IDE and you like upload code to it and the code lives in the chip. And then, you know, you can do these simple programs and it was made for beginners. And people are still use the Uno. It's still like a massively popular chip. It can still do a lot. There's you know, thousands and thousands of libraries and example codes and tutorials online, but it did kind of top out at this like maker educational community. And then Arduino wanted to kind of like get into other markets, which makes sense because people have been using Arduino for 20 years and they're like, well, now I'm in industry and I want to use it in industry. And so they designed the pro line, which was, you know, in general, not open source, but was more powerful like the Portenta and it had vision and had like edge AI and sensors and like more advanced um, use cases. It wasn't meant for students. It was meant for people who wanted to um, like with the Opta, it's like a PLC. It's like for industrial automated usage. And there was this like third branch that did get explored, but also kind of like didn't last as long. There was the Yun and the TN, which I, I forgot about, um, which did use a Qualcomm Atheris. And then um, the tray, which was the Beagle Bone, Beagle Board slash Arduino, which, which, which like all these, there's underneath this tin that has the Arduino Yun logo, there's like a Linux processor. And then there is a, um, connected to it is a microcontroller like an AppMega 3234 or an, you know, a uh, ARM Cortex M0. So it's like, they definitely have kind of like tried this kind of thing. They dipped their bit toes. Before. Yeah, they dipped their toes. their first rodeo. But, the, I, you know, these were, these were discontinued. I think one of the issues is, is that Arduino, their strength was microcontrollers. And so when they got acquired by Qualcomm, Qualcomm like came in and was like, well, we're experts at embedded Linux, you know, low power, high, you know, like we make these chips and we support them. Like this is what we do. Um, and Qualcomm isn't good at education, making things easier, you know, make a market, um, you know, getting hundreds of thousands of developers to, make tutorials and libraries and, and projects. And so, you know, what's interesting is, is you know, they say it's synergistic. Um, mm. You know, Arduino is really good at the um, getting beginners started. That's like what they're, what they're famous for. 
Qualcomm is really famous for like very powerful chips. And so this is kind of like, you know, their hybrid of that where you have the Arduino core running on the STM32 and on the Qualcomm chip, you have um, mainline Debian Linux. So it's like standard Linux. You could, I'm sure there's a way to get into a shell. You can mm. pip install stuff. You can, you know, run your standard Linux software if you want. You run emulators. You can run, you know, um, you don't have to run Python if you don't want. You can, you can run like Go or Node or whatever. You can run a browser if you so wish. Um, so the processor is a quad two gigahertz processor with, like I said, two or four uh, gigs of RAM on board, um, 16 or 32 gig of, of flash. So yeah, it's a, it is basically a single board computer um, with a sub microcontroller as well. And um, you can see where all these components are in the back. But I think mostly the deal here is like, while you could log in and, and access these chips directly and you can buy this chip. You know, ironically, it's like buying the chip itself is about half the cost of the board. So if you're interested in playing with this chip, you might as well just get this board and well. integrate it because it's, you know, ready to go. Um, but you still get the friendly Arduino headers that let you plug in shields. So the top set of headers are the STM32, the J digital and J analog and J SPI. So those are connected to the STM32. So that was what gives you, you know, again, analog, digital, SP, um, SPI, I squared C, 3.3 volt logic. And I think it's five volt logic safe, except in analog mode, I think I read. Um, so, you know, you're connecting to sensors and I squared C and OLEDs and TFT displays, whatever, use that. And then the bottom is where you get the contacts for the high speed. And um, what I thought was neat was on the bottom, sorry, this is the top, on the, the bottom, J media, and JMISC, those are 1.8 volt signals. So they're not expecting you to connect them like with a jumper connector, but if you want um, MIPI DSI, camera connector, um, other high speed, I think, you know, um, SDMMC. So if you want to add a SDMMC card, um, uh, 1.8 volt uh, GPIO, I squared C or SPI or I2S that goes directly into the Linux core, UR, et cetera, that's where you would get them on the bottom connectors. Right now, there isn't a subboard that this would plug into, but I'm sure Arduino is working on one that will, you know, like give you Ethernet and CAN bus and all that good stuff. Um, and here's the block diagram. You know, of course, check out the data sheet. You can zoom in to see it. Again, I think they can, the chips communicate over your SPI, but it's a little bit unclear. Um, I couldn't quite, you know, it's like without knowing the underlying software, um, but they do communicate underneath and, and, um, so you can read signals from Linux without through the STM32 without having to like do the by hand communication. Like you don't have to set up your own channel. It's um, it's like using their bridge software that they've developed from like the Yun and the TN and the um, and the tray. And the way you program it is not through the IDE. So you know, like I said, you're used to the IDE. You load you know, load it up. You type in code. You compile it and you upload a firmware binary. That's not how it works anymore. Instead. Um, App Lab, which you need a queue to run, and I don't have one, so I, I couldn't. I ran the software, but it didn't do anything. But you can see um, example, like you know, some of the example codes and projects that have been posted. You can kind of get a sense of it. You can um, write code, and the Python code runs on the Linux system. So there's already, you know, you can burn an image into the eMMC on the Qualcomm, um, and it'll boot up Linux, you know, very quickly. And then you can basically run Python 3 code directly on it. And then you can also run Arduino sketches that are compiled using the Zephyr core on the chip, right? I think it's, I think it's compiled on the chip and then sent over SWD to the um, STM32. So the Dragonwing compiles code for the STM32. And then bricks, which are a way of packaging, I think, Docker containers. Um, although it seems, seems like some of them may not have Dockers, but if you have, want like um, web servers, if you want to do visual recognition, if you want to run emulators, and so you don't have to deal with um, versioning and installing software directly onto the eMMC because that's kind of, for people who've done single board Linux computing stuff, it's kind of where you end up messing up stuff. You're like, oh shit, I installed this Python version and then what I need another one and then this is conflicting and this doesn't work and then I'm editing device tree overlays. So they're kind of like, hey, look, just use um, containers for all of that. 
And the App Lab runs on your computer, you connect over USB, and it lets you do all the controls so you have this kind of isolation between you and the complexity of a single board Linux installation. And then also, of course, if anything ever gets messed up, it's really easy for you to say, oh, shoot, you know, my code is living on my development machine. I can always zap the Arduino queue, reinstall the Linux, and you know, start over with my program in case something ever gets um, completely borked, like you would with your um, classic Arduino Uno, right? It's like if something, if your Arduino Uno hard faults, it's not like, oh no, I can't get to my code anymore. Your code lives on your computer anyways. You just open up the IDE and reload the code into it. Someone's looking forward to blinking an LED with IPDDR Correct and fork. You can, you, but you can say the smartest, <laughs> most edge AI. I mean, it makes sense. Look, if you want to do, and the thing is, you know, everyone does want to do LI, they, AI. They want to run LLMs. They want to do vision yeah, recognition. They want to do audio recognition. You can't do that on a Cortex M7, even an M7. You really do need to have a very powerful processor. And so, um, so you do it. This is how you do it, right? So, um, so what it looks like. I think the bricks are interesting because I. I was asking about these. I'm like, are these Python libraries? It's like, well, like they're, they're Python libraries wrapped in, I think, a Docker package containers. And I think it's smart because, you know, again, it's like when I see people using stuff like a Raspberry Pi, a common issue is like, oh, no, you installed the wrong version of TensorFlow and you're never going to undo it. You should just start over. Um, and so having yeah. Docker containers makes it like Little instances or not. Nice. Yeah, it's like you, you, they, they, you know, the, the stuff that people have learned from the last like decade or two of you know DevOps is now coming to microcontrollers. That's kind of smart. Like I always see like people who do embedded are like always a decade or two behind what all yeah. other developments have learned. Yeah, but you know, you know the joke is going to be it works fine on my remote controller. Yeah. Here, yeah. here, let me ship you my microcontroller. Right. So <laughs> it's like that is yeah. kind of cool. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, it's like if you can't. Not so funny now. Yeah, it's like one of the biggest issues with. Um, like Raspberry Pi projects is really hard to do reproduction because um, versions of Linux, versions of bespoke. Python, versions of the sub libraries all change constantly. Like I was just helping someone with a TensorFlow project. And I was like, oh shit, this was written for TensorFlow 1 and TensorFlow 2 is out. And it's, even if you import as TensorFlow 1 no. the compatibility mode, it still doesn't work. And you can't no. even get the old one anymore. So, you know, I think this is, this is wise to always be able to reproduce it so you can have embedded projects that can can last and run for uh, many years. Um, there's projects on the project hub. I get, it'll give you a really good sense of what this board can do. Um, once we get one, we'll do a project as well. Meanwhile, you can pre-order it uh, from DigiKey for 44 bucks, which is a great deal. For like basically the cost of like your standard development board, you get a full single board lens computer and my controller and headers and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and built-in memory, which is nice because a lot of single board computers, you have to also get an SD card. You don't need that. Um, comes with it ready to go. All you need is a USB cable, and then you can get it uh, programmed from your computer like pretty much immediately with App Lab. Which I said, it, it, I didn't show it, but it's available for Mac, Windows, and Linux. Yeah, and we have one on order. I think they should send one to Lamar because it sounds like she can do something with it. Oh, yeah, and sure. we'll uh, we'll have we'll have uh, more information about this and the ongoing story about open source and Arduino, and more. But as always, there's one place you can get it. It's DigiD. That's right. That's where, that's where I go. Pre-order today. That's where you go. Hi, I'm MPI.